attention for what I think is going to be a fascinating panel on technological change and global governance in health. And I'd very much like to invite uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Hamad Al Thani to the platform here. Christian Brechot is already here. Madame Dumanier, please, thank you. And uh, is Sheikh Mohammed here? Please, Father Sir. Uh, our three panelists are going to wax eloquent on, uh, on the subject, but it does occur to me that um, when I look at you in the audience and I look at our panelists here, our distinguished panelists, most of you, most of us, I hope, include myself, will live into our 80s and plenty of you will make it past the 100 mark. So this means that modern technology has actually improved our health. However, we have ailments, epidemics that cross frontiers. AIDS, SARS, Ebola, Zika. I mean, these are maladies which actually demand uh, collaboration between governments and between health systems. They also demand big um, improvements big inventions in the field of medical research. So what I would first like to do is ask Sheikh Dr. Mohammed bin Hamad Al Thani, who is the Director of Public Health, Ministry of Public Health, Qatar, to take the floor. Sheikh Mohammed. Yes, from there. Uh, thank you very much for your kind invitation. We are very bl glad here to be here with you in, in, war, in World Policy Conference. We believe that this is important dialogue for all the countries that work together, and it's always a chance for us to learn from each other. Uh, as my experience as Director of Public Health in the last 10 years, and how we move westward in Qatar, and many people ask us, what's the reason that Qatar grow very quickly, either there are many countries have oil and gas before. One of the main things that is mentioned here as interesting me is, 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 is governance and technology. These things are the future of the 21st century. In every century, before that, the industrial revolution, now it's the technology revolution, and maybe mainly starting by internet. I want to start first from governance that we learned as Qatar. Before, we don't have a, 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 a medical college. So all our people travel around the world, study in USA, UK, Canada, uh, in Arab world, you know, even uh, Egypt, Syria, Pakistan. Then we come back with different knowledge. And this different you know, countries have given us a lot of richness in our health sector. Then we move forward to understand more how to governance of the world and the value of governance internationally. Of course, all the world thinks that the last six years we have less deaths yeah, and, and grow in, in, in population due only for peaceful, 90-80% peaceful world before, than before. But it's mainly they forget about the effect of medical technology and the innovation that happened that followed this to grow by, by vaccinations, antibiotics, and other intervention that happen mainly in public health. Here we would like to think always about governance. Now I saw today in the morning a lot of worries that in change of the leadership, it will make risk for the world uh, improvement. And this is something that is not acceptable. If you read the history always, you will find that in history, nobody can stop humanity from growing up. Anybody will try to stop that, he will not win in the end. So, we understand well that to lead the world, you should think about the humanity and the growth of humankind. So this was happening before but between one leading country or empire that grow the world, but now this is not, in a, that not anymore. Now it's working more for global governance. And we need to uh, put stress on this word, global governance. It's not acceptable to put all the world uh, risk on one uh, decision or one person or one country. Is the world is, is grown enough, the internet has traveled quickly between countries. I want to assure that if even there's something wrong happening in country, it doesn't uh, affect all the world. This is something we have learned in Qatar. We, if even I'm here with you in a very political issue because we're having working in intersection collaboration. And this many people from foreign affairs come to Ministry of Health to support us with some leading issues in health, and we come sometimes support them in this issue. 
This synergism gives us solidarity and to move forward. The second thing Qatar is known for a long time, to invest tax, God, we don't have any tax on electronic technology. So always we invest in technology in early stages between the West and the East, the Far East. And we get always the technology which help us sometimes that without having much sophisticated people or, or program systems, the technology will help us to cope and to, to excel quicker by this technology. Now, I think everyone knows not is too much to know about dictation, grammar, the computer is fixing everything. In health, now we are having a systems uh, of se electronic surveillance system in, in Hamad Hospital. In our system, we have now Cerner program, which is connecting all the world and monitoring the system properly and easier way than before. We believe this practice should be grown around the world. And we have different strategies that have been achieving a lot of effects. One of these very simple things is car accidents. Before in Qatar, it was 26 per 100,000 debtors and now have moved forward with the decision of the country and technology, it moved to less than one third, eight per, two, uh, per 100,000. This means that speed limit, cameras, all this technology have supported us not only by the culture, by monitoring the system properly. If you tell me what you want, I want from this as a health person, I want to tell you that we respect the world, the doctors respect each other, you know, around the world. And they work together without race, nationality, and this would help the world to give magical is issues in health. Like now we have treatment for hepatitis C. Nobody believed, like Egypt and Pakistan, having 20% of their population with hepatitis C, and now they have a chance to survive this. People were divorced, and now we, we have Vi Viagra and Cialis, and we get a lot of things moving forward to keep the families connected more. And and we have promoted life that you can study enough and still have just to enjoy the life because of uh, lo longer liberty of, of life and better productivity in your part, giving a hope for people. We want this to transfer even in politics. We want to do a plan like we have the brave uh, sustainable development goals that happened to 2030, putting the world together on the same target and the same track. So whatever who is from the right party, from the left party, everybody should be responsible to deliver this uh, sustainable development goals. And this gives us a positive that if we achieve maybe 80 or 90% of this in 2030, the world will be in different place. I want to say something that it's our responsibility for history, if we check very well, that we need every time to move the world into, uh, to the future. This is what's happening all the time by different reasons. Of course, there is some catastrophes happen in the world, some disasters, but if you look very well, like any movie, the evil start, but, but uh, at the end, the, the good people wins. And this is what we want to do here, and we are hoping from this to find a declaration to, to may have a better governance that whatever is like insurance for the world, whatever something mistake happen, the system will keep going on because the good people wrote it long time and agreed on before having the wrong people in power. The second thing is advancing technology and try, uh, try to market it as soon as possible to the other countries because some of the countries they can make a leap frog jump like to a, some kind of didn't use ATM, they directly used their phone to take cash from the machines in Africa. And this is because they, they didn't get need this middle part, they jump ju directly to the future. We hope that this will help the world even to go to finish the goal of poverty, goal number one, no poverty, which is a challenging one. But I believe with good humans, we'll always find a better generation for our children and grandsons. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Shukran uh, Jazeelan. Just one question, actually, on Qatar. Uh, I mean, one of the great problems, it seems to me, in the medical world now is that um, antibiotics are becoming disease resistant. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of countries, especially in the Middle East, you can simply go to a pharmacy and buy antibiotics over the counter without a prescription. What happens in Qatar? Yeah, uh, I tell you, we are in the Middle East, but of course we'll find many things in Qatar will be a little exceptional. <laughs> of course, we have a law for eight to 10 years not to prescribe antibiotics without, uh, without uh, a prescribe from the doctor. This is working very well. But always the challenge, and this is something worries that we're starting to invest in, but Qatar is, in the end is a small country and the challenges come usually from the massive countries. You know, strategically fix the big countries, automatically the small country will be fixed. So this should be starting from the bigger countries, and maybe the technology will help us to track every pill, you know, like for the, for the addiction things, like morphine, other, you can uh, track every pill. And by the technology, you can make it easier for antibiotics to, to say who took this pill and where this package was sent to, 
mm -hmm. and to get it. The only challenge now, the world is becoming smaller and smaller, traveling is easy. So when you fix it in Qatar and you don't fix it in a neighbor country, you'll always have some smuggling here and there. So it should be having an innovative idea to, to tackle where this, this antibiotic is used and more awareness in the medical field. Thank you very much. Uh, now it's my pleasure to ask Christian Brechot uh, from the Institut Pasteur. And Christian, I know you have uh, a presentation to make, so please. Thank you very much, Mr. Andrews. And uh, thank you to Thierry de Montbriad for the invitation and for setting up this, uh, this session. I, I would start with a quote from a Nobel Prize, Sidney Brenner. And he stated that progress in science depends on new techniques, new discoveries, and new ideas, probably in that order. This may be a too strong statement, but it really illustrates that technology is really at the heart of the progress in biomedical uh, research. Um, now, before moving forward, it's important to emphasize that scientists do need, uh, in the field of biomedical research, infrastructures, equipments, technological platforms, and this at several levels. Uh, sequencing, for example, and uh, Mrs. Uh, Dr. Zhu will present this for the Beijing Genome Institute, is now a bench, in, a bench side equipment, and in fact, a lot of it is out, uh, outsourced uh, in, in the centers such as the Beijing Genome Institute. The key is bioinformatics and integrative biology. But life science and biomedical research has moved to uh, a status which was previously uh, devoted to physics or to chemistry, which is the need to large equipment, such, for example, as this cryo-electron microscopy, at the national level to the synchrotron. And it's interesting to see that about 35% of the activity of the synchrotron soleil in France is devoted to life science. So it's a complete redistribution of the need this in the context, obviously, of connectivity, sharing information, and the major point of automatization and the blend between individual creativity of the scientist and automatization. Uh, it is very relevant for, our past for the Pasteur Institute. I will not go into, de into detail, which is a large research institute in France. Uh, multidisciplinary, 2,500 people, also involved very much in public health, in teaching, and in public-private partnerships. And this in the context of an international network. And in addition to this, and it is really my pleasure, we have initiated with Qatar very interesting uh, collaborations. So in this context, uh, this is an example of the, what we call the Titan cryo-electron microscopy. This is a new generation of uh, electron microscopy. It costs 10 million euros. It needs a special building. It cannot be decentralized. And uh, it can lead to some informations which are unvaluable. This is a picture of in red, blue, and yellow of antibodies which bind to the Ebola viral protein. And this image really allow to design new treatments, new diagnostic tests, and new vaccines. And Felix Ray in our institute has recently shown that antibodies to the dengue virus cross-react with antibodies to the Zika virus. And this uh, opens very interesting perspective for prevention and treatment. Another example, you can directly visualize the viral particle of HIV as we never have been uh, able before to, to do so. So regarding the governance, we really come to a point where each of the research institutes worldwide cannot have all the large infrastructures, and that we need to have networks and of distributed infrastructures. This is the example of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory with facilities in Heidelberg, many platforms, in Grenoble, structural biology, in uh, the UK with uh, bioinformatics, and in Italy with murine biology. And there are other examples, and there will be an increasing number. Now, coming to the sequencing, we know, all of us, that it's a revolution. 
uh, that the cost has very much declined and that this has allowed a new appraisal, actually, of the human genome and the implication of uh, disorders of the human genome. But it's always important to remind that you have other technologies, I'm not going to detail, this is what we call microfluidic at the Institut Pasteur, and it really allows to set up new immunoassays, which are 100 to 1,000 times more sensitive than the current assays. So all this progress has led, really, to the concretization over the past uh, 15 years of what we call personalized medicine, precision medicine, where we are really able to identify the parameters of an individual, of a single individual among the population, and to design biomarkers for prediction of treatment, efficacy of treatments, side effects. And the, uh, we, many analyses show that this can only increase in the future. Already 42% of the new drugs from the companies are, uh, can be a I minimum mean, to be personalized, uh, to be targeted on a personal basis. And it comes to 73% for cancer. And we foresee a very significant increase in the future. And it's a topic of large investment for the companies. So we, we need to put this in the context of the global and one health perspective. And this slide illustrates a very important move. Uh, in the UK, with Genomic England, in the US, with the Precision Medicine Initiative, uh, there is a move to have hundreds of thousands of individuals, hundreds of thousands of individuals who are followed up on a prospective basis with all their genome analysis being determined, and this will allow to really have a new insight uh, into global health. The resilience project is particularly interesting. The idea is you follow up a cohort of individuals who have mutations, they should have the disease, they don't have the disease. And so the question is the reverse, is why? And which are the components which modulate the impact on the genome of mutations? This is a major turn, this is very demanding, but we need to have this large cohort. So obviously we need to share this information worldwide, and uh, clearly we have entered the era where technology allows us, and this has been shown in other sessions, to really be beyond, I would say, the goodwill and uh, the, the talkings, really to mine electronic health records uh, for better research application and clinical care. And we're, as we are all of us aware of, it's about really uh, coming from the data obtained in the individuals to uh, data which are obtained in the laboratory, then integrate the data, and this is the key word in database, and then transfer this to a number of uh, institutions uh, and doctors. And now we have entered the era of large networks which gather, for example, in the US, but we also have this in Europe and in Asia, uh, different hospitals, research institutions, which can share this data, obviously this raises a number of questions uh, which can be uh, addressed before, uh, later. Now we have entered also the era where large companies are becoming new players and they provide new software frameworks which have now helped to empower people to take a more active role in their health. This is for an example with Apple, this is with Microsoft, for respiratory illness, this is uh, with, I cannot read, but in, in uh, oncology, but I could have uh, cited, uh, obviously, other companies. But this is a major move that the patient is a much more active partner of his or her health through these technologies. We are entered the era of artificial intelligence, deep learning, Facebook is an example, I could cite others, and again, it's about the individual being part of the whole process. Finally, rapid diagnostic test is a key point, point of care. 
there are now disposable which will completely overhaul the way we regulate our tests and the health system. And it goes beyond uh, the diagnostic test. I like this slide which shows the evolution of the stethoscope over the years since the first uh, discovery by, uh, setting up by Lionek. And we have so sophisticated uh, disposal that again, uh, we can use them in a very different way. So it's about what Leroy Hood calls predictive, personalized, preventive and participa participatory approach to medicine, the famous P4, but we have to be realistic. It's also about personalized, problematic, and promising, because we know that we have several challenges. Reproducibility of the data, this is a key point. If we share, if we transfer data which are not reproducible, uh, this obviously has no value. Economics, questions with regulatory agencies, and ethics, confidentiality of the data, and so on. So the question, and especially for an, in, in, an institute such as the Pasteur Institute, is how really again to integrate all this progress in the global and one health perspective. And it is clear that the Institute Pasteur is very much focused on its international network. Uh, 33 institutes now in 26 countries, and we are setting up presently the one in Guinea, in Conakry. So again, rapid diagnostic tests are very important for many countries where we are working, and they are completely changing the pattern of diagnostics. It really allows this uh, uh, connection, test on-site, communicate, and then act. At Pasteur, we have been working very hard on next generation diagnostic tests. This is an example of a task force that we have set up following the Ebola crisis. Obviously, I don't want to go into detail. You have several examples of immunoassay and molecular biology-based assay. They share the same concept. They can be performed very rapidly, and again and again, they can be performed on-site. I'm very proud of this. This is what our students had just recently won at Pasteur, the gold medal at what is called the, Interna the International Genetically Engineering um, uh, co Competition, iGEM, in Boston, Engineering Competition in Boston. And they have designed a, a, a tool to both on the same apparatus, trap a mosquito, test for the presence of a virus, and share the results throughout the world. And this is how it will stand uh, in the field. So we have a bulk of technologies which allow to work on a centralized organization and also to work on a decentralized organization. So I will skip this slide, but just to illustrate again that uh, we provide infrastructure, teaching, on-site capacities uh, in, all these, uh, in all these countries. But the point I want to make is that the new technologies, the capacity both on-site to generate the data and to share the data, allow to design worldwide a regional and global approach. Again, I don't want to go into detail. These are several scientific consortia which are run globally, be on malaria, on resistance to antibiotics, on a number of uh, pathogens and clinical conditions. And this, we have really entered the era of molecular epidemiologic map of a disease. This is a New England Journal Medicine paper which has been published by 10 Pasteur Institutes working with several partners in many countries, and they provide the first molecular map of resistance to treatment of malaria by what we call artemisimine. This would not have been feasible only five years ago. The Institut Pasteur is obviously at the heart of uh, the reaction to a sanitary crisis, and again, all the uh, 
uh, technologies, be for sequencing, be for sharing the information, are at the heart of the coordination we can set up to meet with all of these sanitary uh, emergencies and crises which are listed here. We, we need to have networks. Uh, we need to have networks between different countries. And this is an example of a network which is, uh, has been supported by the European uh, Commission, which is really about one health. That means merging the efforts of clinical medicine, veterinary medicine, to really provide a survey of uh, infections and emerging infections in different countries. And this is a good example because you want to establish this network, but then you need the correct uh, technologies to do so. This is another example performed in partnership with the United States, with the uh, Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Reaction, which is really again on the setting up of networks to prevent and react against a sanitary crisis, for example, for avian flu, uh, for the influenza. So we have set up now uh, within the international network, this is an example in Cameroon, of novel system architectures and features of platforms. Platform to generate the data, platform to share the data, and provide early warning systems. So again, it's always the same organization, which is very easy to describe on a slide, very, very difficult to set up, actually, where from left to right, you generate the data on site, you merge the data, you integrate the data, and this is really where it comes as difficult, and you, then you are able to transfer the data. The point I want to make with these slides is that what has been perceived initially only a few years ago as something really uh, which would be only focused, only possible for, say, uh, so-called developed countries, is now absolutely amenable to emerging and developing countries. Finally, this is a, an important uh, action which, again, illustrates the, the potential of this evolution. This is what we called the Pasteur Global Health Genomics Center. It means in selected institute of the network, provide the biobanking capacities, meeting with the regulatory constraints, the ethics, uh, and the economics, and then provide to this selected institute the capacity to generate data on site, instead of transferring the samples to France, to the US, to other countries. But then, to share the data with a computer biology-based uh, information system. And obviously, we cannot do this by ourselves. We are in the era of partnerships. This is a clear example of the need for governing rules. We are inter interacting with the Gates Foundation on this, uh, with the Sage Bio Networks, also with industrial partners. And uh, this is a case where we have to share the information but also to meet with constraints, obviously, again, with confidentiality, uh, with intellectual property, with overall security. So to close, I would like to shift the, uh, the topic just for a very few slides. On the, I have nearly finished. But because I believe we need to remain very humble with regard to technologies. There is a very interesting topic, which is the intestinal microbiote. That means we have actually two genomes, our human genome and what we call the bacterial genome, about 1.5 kilograms of bacteria in our intestine. And the interplay between these two genomes, these two genomes is really shaping, actually, our personality, uh, our features, and is very important for a number of diseases, including so-called non-communicable disease, diabetes, obesity, cancer, neurological disorders. Sequencing of the intestinal bacteria was impossible about 10 years ago. 
the progress in technology in sequencing has led to analyze in detail these populations. And it has contributed to a medical revolution which is ongoing, which is the capacity to transfer the gut microbiote from here one animal to the other and to transfer a given phenotype. But now this is possible in humans. And this is a New England Journal of Medicine paper, very impressive, which shows, I, I the pointer, is not working on this screen, but when you have patients with Clostridium difficile, which is a very difficult infection to treat, if you compare in the center those who have received a fecal transplantation, a microbiote transplantation from patients who have recovered from Clostridium difficile, and you compare on the right part those only treated by regular antibiotics, there is a huge difference and those who receive fecal microbiote from recovered patients recover themselves. So the point I want to make is that this is excellent, but if you look at this, this is really an old concept which has been revisited. It was well known in veterinary medicine. It was well known by the Chinese and during several Chinese dynasties. And so the point is that in some cases, what really technology allows us to do is a reappraisal of all concepts. But this is not a problem. This is at the benefit of the patient. So to close, again, we, we speak of technology, we speak of automatization, but we should never forget that individuals will be at the heart of creativity. And this is what this slide illustrates when we recruit young scientists. We want them to be modern, but we want them to keep the image of the founder of uh, Louis Pasteur. So this is a painting from Magritte, which name is uh, La Clairvoyance. And I like it because it really shows that Technology has made huge progress, huge progress. It is a real revolution. And obviously, I have only shown a part of it. Uh, we see the applications. Well, however, we are still, uh, we are painting the bird, but we are still looking at the egg. And what we hope for the next years is really to be able to have this transition from the egg to the bird. And this is really what the Institute Pasteur, with the partners, is very much committed to. Thank you very Thank much. You. Merci, uh, Dr. Brescio. And I'm sure we will come back to ethics and personalized medicine later when we have the questions from the audience. And now it's my pleasure to ask uh, uh, Dr. Zhu Man Ye from the Genomic Institute in Beijing. Yes. Where I think you've brought sequencing down to a very cheap, yes, affordable yeah. level. Right, right, yeah. Actually, we, 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 uh, we, we create the, the trend of the sequencing. So I have a, a quick presentation. Yes, please. Actually, uh, we we not cause the Beijing Genomic Institute because uh, seven seven years before we move uh, from Beijing to Shenzhen. Now we are a totally private organization. So the down of life area that's my topic. Why? Uh, several years before when I first visit uh, Nobel Muse Museum in Sweden, I saw this long ruler. It's a two meters ruler. And a one size that is 200 uh, big unit. The other one is, is a, a 200 science and technology br breakthrough. So it surprised me in the last year, 2000, it's a human genome project almost completely deciphered. Actually, it's not completely deciphered because that project spent uh, 13 years and a uh, thousand scientists uh, joined the, the project. So it's, it, uh, it takes 3.8 billion US dollar to sequence one hum human genome. But you see now, um, of course, everybody will ask the gene, what's the, what's the relationship between gene and the disease? Actually, it's very closely related to us, uh, including uh, birth defect, also the infectious disease, and also the cancer of the chronic disease. So every kind of disease 
related, very closely related to your genes. Of course, not, not only the gene from parents, also from your gut um, bacteria. So that's the, the, the right light is the Moore's law. Everybody knows Moore's law, how revolution, revolution the, uh, the, IT, uh, the, the IT area. The, the, the green one is the a cost of per genome. Actually, the, in, at the end, at the beginning of the uh, 2000, uh, BGI uh, founded in 1999, and then we moved to Shenzhen in 2007. So you see the, the first, uh, um, po the, the second point. And, uh, and in 2010, we bought 128 sequences. So actually, we, we create a, a market for sequencing. And then at that time, we occupied a 40% market global, globally. And in last year, we launched our own sequencer. And that we uh, reduced the cost of genome to 1,000. So from in last uh, 50 years, from $3.8 billion, to $1,000. In we are very confident in the next three years, we will reduce the cost to $100. And this picture from the Singularity University, the chairman of bioinformatics, uh, Roman McCauley, uh, gave a lesson to the MBA, EMBA student. So you see the, the BGI in the middle. Actually, BGI open a new a door for a new world. Why, what's a new world? It's, we, we just a transformation from, from, from industrial area to the life uh, area. And uh, I would like to, to say what's the secret of the world, the changing the world. We know the world is changing. So what's the secret? Like look, look back the uh, 200 years history, this three can, uh, kind of product or uh, invisible product like service uh, change the world. The first one is uh, a private car. And Ford Model T uh, make everybody, every family have a, have a car because of cheap. Uh, I, I think we still remember the slogan of, of Ford is every family have a car. And the, and the second the information is now, you know, PC, like the Wintel system, uh, and uh, Google as smartphone change the world totally. So that's Moore's law, uh, in, uh, create, uh, create that. And uh, in the next stage, that, that's why I mentioned the, the rule of the Norbis law, because that's ma milestone for the next, uh, for this, century. So I think genome sequencing, we call it the super, super Moore's law, will, 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 will totally change. That's a radical change. It's a parad paradigm shift. So what's the sequence? It's a low cost, uh, high production, also the high throughput we call in sequencing, and access, accessible for everybody. So we just, that's our target. We will make the uh, genome sequencing affordable and accessible to everybody. And uh, that's the BGI triangle. It's, BGI is a very unique organization. We have a research institute. Uh, actually, we uh, published the uh, top journal uh, papers, over 40, um, over 40 uh, papers on the top journal, like Cell, New England, Nature and Science. Uh, up to now, we already published 250 papers on these four kind of journals. And we also have the industrial side. We have our own clinical uh, service uh, company. Now it's already, uh, it will be listed on the, um, in public. It already uh, 10, yeah, 10 billion US dollars is valued. And the other side, we, we uh, benefit the society. We just uh, cut the, the cost and the, the, the price of the sequence genome. Um, 
so we pay a, pay more attention about the society. But at the core, you know, our advantage is the big data, large sample, and full coverage uh, populations. We believe the high quality data, full coverage data, will much greater than AI and deep learning. Of course, we need, but first you have to, you have need the high quality data. So uh, one person I, I have to mention is the former president of Imperial College of London. He say BGI is not only innovating. You are changing the way of innovation. So actually, we integrated uh, basic research and the industry and the popular livelihood. So we, we, we call it the BGI triangle. And they already sequencing uh, 5 million people. Uh, so I don't, because of time limited, I don't want to mention too much. Uh, the, the first one, the NIPT, is a non invasive prenatal um, testing is a disruptive technology. So uh, we, we already finished uh, 1.6 million people. And uh, now the global healthcare challenge is, is, a, is a three of the big challenges, aging population and the younger cancer patient. The, uh, the last one is a serious birth defect, especially in, in a developing country. So how we can face the challenge? what we can do for that. I have to mention the story of the Cyprus. In, in, in 1973, Cyprus uh, initiated a national program. They collaborated uh, with the scientists, with the church, with the government. government. They, they re just reduced the, of the, uh, um, of the thalassemia. So, of course, as a, uh, as a developing country, it's uh, do much better than UK, than, uh, yeah, than Italy. So I think it's a time to be cooperated with, with each other between developing country and developed country. So that's a paradigm shift, as ma I mentioned, need many cha changes in, the, in, the, uh, in this area. So we need a new discovery. So Scientists sh uh, should, uh, should pay a lot of effort, and the technology sh should be developed, and the management even should be changed. That's why we, we built up a very unique organization. It's not like a, uh, not like a company. And the ethics, of, of course, need to change um, policy of, and culture. So I think so many changes, not only one country can face, we should collaborate with each other. So that's a photo from the elevator. You see, the three most important age is health, happiness, and hope. So I think it's, it's time to initiate a war on disease. So Biden or, 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 uh, already needs uh, the cancer uh, moonshot initiated by Obama, and, uh, but not only in, in the developed country. I think we, sh we should work together. And uh, that's the, the most brilliant um, things in BGI, not the sequence, not the cost and the speed, but I think the vision. We, the vision is the omics for all, for better life. So I think despite of challenge and difficult, we should work together. We, we should don't forget, don't be, not only don't be evil, we should always for good. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Zhu. Um, we, have, we have about 18 minutes, so not a lot of time. Um, but let me just get onto this question of ethics. Um, we are making, well, not we, you are making such advances in science and medicine. At some point, there must, be, there must already be ethical boundaries. Um, and if I put it in a journalistic phrase, are you worried about designer babies? Um, Dr. Bershu. I mean, this gets into the territory of eugenics almost. 
Excuse me. This almost gets into the uh, into the, the, the realm of eugenics. Of yes, that. yes. Well, I mean, there are really several tiers to be considered because uh, so yes, we are very much worried, uh, and, and I believe that we should be worried. I mean, as soon as you start, even you see, again, you have, for example, technologies such as the famous CRISPR-Cas technology which is very popular and where you have the possibility to have, say, reprogrammation of some embryonic cells. These are some fundamental questions that we must address. That's one point. But from what I presented, we already have the major concern of, uh, for me, this is a key issue on how are we going to secure all this data and the access to this data. And this is a general question, obviously, nothing new, nothing special to the Institut Pasteur or to other institutes. But now that it comes to the, uh, now that we have really easier way uh, to generate this data, to transmit this data, and we know that we must transmit this data, I believe that we have really to, to sit uh, with several uh, parts of the society and really decide how we want to uh, to determine, for example, some data should remain the property of the individual. Some data uh, might be the property of the state. Uh, some data might be shared. So now the good point is that my understanding, although I'm not an expert, is that you have technologies which should allow to do so. So this is a general answer because I believe that we are at the dawn of this. But yes, it's a very important concern. Let me put almost the same question to Sheikh Mohammed. Uh, I mean, in Britain, for example, there is quite um, a serious body, I can't remember the name of it, to deal with ethical issues on medicine, especially medical research. And I wonder if Qatar has the same thing. Yes, thank you for the question. It's very important and always debatable in our region about the ethical, and usually sometimes our region is conservative. Things doesn't start usually in our region. It needs more open region to start the, the bold decisions. But in Qatar, we have a research uh, uh, committee and we have a Qatar National Research Fund that take care about every research, the human rights and the ethics before we start anything. This is something that we, it's, it's known in Qatar. Nobody can do something against ethics and the humans in Qatar as the signature before you do that. But what I'm saying about discussing about the ethics of these issues, always we are worried from the future. But the future always give us good things too, you know, because uh, we were worried about the internet, about our privacy. Okay, it's hurting us, but it gives us a g big value. We are worried about uh, IVF. Some people were saying forbidding IVF. Now it's a big value for many people to keep living and make them more happy. So, of course, you can use IVF in the wrong way, like you can use a knife, a gun, many other things. You know, you can use the internet in the wrong things too. But, but things are, as a whole, moving the world to the future of humanity and giving them and, and many things that they couldn't believe that they can achieve. I don't think anyone can stop the, uh, the wheel from going on, but we need always to work only on directing it to the right decisions together. Thank you. Madam Ju, uh, really the same question. I mean, you, you are, the genome is no longer a mystery. Now, you're talking about the Internet of Life. Where do we go eventually? I mean, when you, if you are going faster than Moore's law, we are really into something uh, absolutely unknown territory, which may or may not be terrifying. It may be wonderful. Every kind of technology is a double-sided war, right? But um, the, the Human Genome uh, Project actually is a di start to digitalize life. It's make the ATCG it's translated the ATCG to one, ver one zero, one zero. So it's, uh, it's uh, life is digital. Uh, 20 years before, nobody believed that. Mm -hmm. But now, it's time. So I think um, I, I would like to give a comment for you uh, for the GU editing. Um, in this year, uh, a case, a children in the uh, in United States uh, uh, killed the thalassemia completely with the, uh, with the gene editing. So you see, if we can, we, we're talking about ethics, but I think ethics is, is a, a kind of production relationship. It uh, should decide is a 
product productivity, right? Mm. So I think thousand years before, uh, the marriage cannot happen outside the one tribe. Yeah. But but now it's uh, you know it's forbidden to marry with uh, th three generation, right? Yeah. So that's a, that's a, a good example for the ethic need to be changed. Yeah. So I I think that's uh, it's a good it's good time because he, uh, health and the longevity is everybody's dream. Hmm. You we we love innovation, but innovation for what, right? So. I think it's the time to, 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 to work on disease, to reduce disease, and collaborate with Qatar and other in Middle East country. Um, so I think, I believe it. I think it's, uh, it's much better than industrial time. OK, excellent. Um, any questions, please, from the audience? If, if you have any burning issue that you'd like to bring up, if you want to design your own population, uh, let me, in that case, turn to Dr. Breschel. You use the, the phrase personalized medicine. Um, doesn't that, in the end, mean that the wealthy will get the medicine they need and the poor will not because the pharmaceutical companies, um, if, they are, if the medicine is personalized, then presumably the market will be smaller and therefore the price will be higher. This is also a, an interesting question. I, I, for this, I'm not so anxious because, you see, before taking the position of president at Pasteur, I was the vice president of a company involved on in vitro diagnostics. And we had this discussion between diagnostics and pharma. Uh, in principle, the pharma would not like to reduce the market because you decrease the number of uh, patients susceptible to receive the drugs. And so it is true that then there might be a tendency to have an increase in the price. But on the other hand, uh, you really target those patients who, who need the drug. And there is a very important point when you speak of precision medicine, which is also to determine those who will have side effects. So you see, in the balance, you have really to take in account uh, all the results, I mean, that's my first part of the question. It's not only about determining the efficacy, but also the tolerance. And so this is really worth uh, taking in charge by the health systems, uh, the, the, the cost. The second point is that the progress in point of care, in rapid diagnostic tests, the capacity to have really everywhere in the world communication about the results will allow M many more patients to benefit it, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, personalized medicine. F for me, the main problem of precision medicine or personalized medicine, whatever, are really the quality of the results which are generated. You see, when you have Beijing Genome Institute, you know you have uh, reproducible results. But we will have worldwide a bulk of information. And if they are not correct, then you come to a precision medicine which is absolutely imprecise. A question from the audience? I can't see anyone. In that case, I'm going to ask uh, one last question, uh, really to, I think, Sheikh Mohammed, but actually, no, all of you. Um, we talk here of governance. And the implication is that this is collaboration between states on a global level. But if you look at, at the headlines, then I think one might argue that the most effective um, body in medicine for the masses at the moment is perhaps the Gates Foundation or the Clinton Global Initiative. Is this a, fa a failure of governments, that the, the space is actually being taken by uh, private individuals. Uh, you touch a very important thing that we are, sometimes we are not happy about is that if you check about the biggest and the oldest institute of one is WHO, World Health Organization. Which and we haven't mentioned once so far. Yes, and, and the challenge that World Health Organization have big, made a big value through history and they are aligning the efforts between countries and make them have the chance 
to meet every year in Geneva to discuss the issues. But it's surprisingly that, you know, the budget of, of World Health Service is only four billion for maybe 10 years, with, with the, the, any, any Ministry of Health in the world maybe, most of them have more than four billion. Some of them have a trillion, some of them have trillions, they have, have 300 billion dollars, and not sharing to put some money in governance more in WHO. And we have a failure that happened like Ebola. They didn't want to pay for Ebola enough, and all of a sudden they are ready to, to pay billions for Ebola. If you started in the prevention early stage, you will not go there. But some, they were not hearing what is the threats are happening, like in Ebola. So uh, Bill Gates' organization is now work alone, but it couldn't work alone, it worked with WHO again. There is Rockefeller, there is uh, Clinton uh, Foundation. Many of them, they, but what happened between these people, they focus on some issues, so they focus, they success, but they don't work comprehensively. Mm. So what we are missing, we are success, having successful story in one subject, but we are losing the time to put more seeds in the, in the ground and see the trees growing up. So we want to be more smart in the future, be comprehensive, and scale the work for different types of subjects to prevent and treat in health. This is what we call the real innovation that started in the 20th century. And we want to keep this in the 21st century in a more smarter way by arranging our, uh, our goals together. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's fascinating. Uh, you have 25, 24 seconds, I'm counting down, huh. to agree or disagree, Dr. Brescia, Madam Duke. Well, I, I agree basically. Bill and Melinda Gates are extraordinary people when you discuss with them. They have done a fantastic job. We really have to recognize. But on the principle, if we speak of governance, this is a problem. Um, Jean is uh, the code of life, the language of life. The nature, maybe the God told us the language. So we should use that. That's my that's my dream.